Welcome to Planted, Finding Your Roots in STEM Careers. Journey with us as we navigate the winding path into tree and plant-related careers with professionals who have taken root or are still branching out. I'm Megan Weisbrook. And I'm Jessica Turner-Scoff. Today, we are going to be talking about traits that you could have in STEM careers. Joining us for this episode is Kevin McIntyre, an arborist climber working at the Morton Arboretum. We'll be talking about how he uses risk assessment in not only his job, but also his life. So thank you so much for being here, Kevin. Oh, thank you for having me. So, Kevin, I understand that arborist climbers um, focus on tree care. You're looking to make sure that the trees themselves are healthy as individuals, but then also making sure that um, the branches aren't at risk for failure, especially if they're in, um, you know, public areas um, where they could pose a risk. Um, so I would imagine that on a daily basis, you're um, assessing, assessing risk for both what you know can harm the tree and then also maybe what needs to be removed um, from the tree. Um, and we're really excited to talk with you about the skill set. Um, but before we jump into um, your work as an arborist, we want to get to know you a little bit also. So, Kevin, can you tell me a little bit about rock climbing, Boy Scouts, and urban forests, and how they're related to each other, and then how they relate to you? Yeah, so you'll come to find out that these are all three these aspects of my life are related. And starting with the Boy Scouts, because obviously that was when I was the youngest, um, you know, it was an opportunity for me to get outdoors and to get away from growing up in the middle of a cornfield mm -hmm. out in <laughs> a little town in the middle of Illinois. And so to be able to experience all these different forests and to be constantly exposed to it um, by going to summer camp and, and sleeping among these just these beautiful red, uh, red pine stands and also to... Uh, you know, experience nature in a whole new way, whether it be through hiking or kayaking or biking or even rock climbing, which is actually where I got <laughs> my start, kind of. And um, and then to kind of follow it up with rock climbing, you know, that that's just another aspect of my life that is back to being outdoors. You know, I, it's almost like uh, a vertical hiking, as I like to call it. I love that. <laughs> Which is, you know, you, and, and you can go biking, you can go hiking, doing whatever in the outdoors. But for whatever reason, rock climbing to me just has changed my perspective on what it means to be outside and connected to nature. Because it's such a personal experience, you alone on the wall um, and just nothing but your fingertips and toes attaching you to this Oof. wall <laughs> and it, it's just a, it's an immense personal challenge as well why and you could be struggling on a rock on a rock face and yet everything around you is so serene the birds are chirping mm -hmm. but you're right there and it's the most intense moment <laughs> and, you know it's seemingly in your life so you know that that the whole aspect of my life as well just kind of reaffirmed my belief that I belong in the outdoors. And then moving on to uh, urban forestry, I actually got my degree in forestry from Southern Illinois University, a bachelor's. And I didn't quite think I would end up with a degree in forestry. I actually had a completely other belief of what I was going to become. But um, I decided at some point that I wanted to dedicate, dedicate my life to the outdoors and being outside. And um, really doing something that's kind of bigger than myself, um, really just bring on home the conservation and environmentalism and really just exposing the benefits of trees. And the common trait between all of them is the outside, the natural world, the environment. Now, you've talked a little bit about being on a rock face and, you know, having your fingertips and chalk and just being really high up. Can you talk a little bit about any sort of memorable experience? Like, what was the best experience you had ever climbing? Yeah, that's that's a great question. And I'd have to say my best climbing experience and even memory was when I was in Red Rocks National Conservation Area near Vegas, and it was the first time I'd ever climbed a route that was over 700 feet. Oh my and goodness. there really isn't much difference in the actual climbing, um, actually moving up, but you're in a totally alien environment, it seems like, because humans should not be 700 feet up on <laughs> some sort of rock face <laughs> in the desert. You know, you, we just don't belong there. But you're up there anyways, and you're, like I said, you're just, you're hanging on by your fingertips and your toes. And it's, it's a very interesting environment, too, because the birds are actually below you, which kind of throws you off That's a little wild. bit. It's, it is. And then 
you have this light wind that's kind of blowing you on the rock and all of a sudden you'll go to you know maybe chalk your hands up with your chalk bag and you'll take it out and all of a sudden this chalk just blows away in the wind um shimmering in the light and it's 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 just this really beautiful experience and, and very serene and a lot of people might think oh you must be an adrenaline junkie being up that high and you know yada 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 but really it's actually a very peaceful and and just calm to be up there it's it's totally not what you'd expect it's wonderful to hear you describe it that way because it sounds terrifying to me <laughs> <laughs> no it's uh that's fair that's fair um it's I'm, only scary when things go wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then you have every reason to worry. I did some climbing when I was living in West Virginia and not that high up, and I'm very grateful for that. I think <laughs> the height I was at was just fine. Um, <laughs> so how does that compare to being in a tree, though? Because it's, I imagine, very different than a rock face. Absolutely. The only similarities that they share are that you are off the ground. Um, where in rock climbing, you're holding on by just your, like I said, your hands and your feet. And the rope's only there to catch you if you, to, if you were to fall. Whereas in tree climbing, you actually utilize the rope to balance and position yourself on the tree. And it is there for fall protection. If you do fall, you'll swing, um, hopefully miss every branch on the way yeah. to the trunk. <laughs> but uh, it, it's really just there to um, not only hold you up, but also for you to actually position yourself and work off of it. So that's where the biggest discrepancy is but also when you're when you're you know when you're climbing a tree one you're getting paid for it <laughs> so <laughs> you know rock climbing is just a hobby uh, but two you know you're you're having 40 to 50 pounds of gear on your saddle which can really make you weigh you down and it it makes uh, climbing trees very challenging and sometimes I think even more so than rock climbing because it also adds in frustration the um, you have specific objectives that you have to meet while you're in the tree such as you know are we pruning this for deadwood are we structurally pruning it um, are we installing cables or lightning protection or bracing it um, so it, it really is just challenging in its own aspects um, and there's just and there is a big difference between the two and a lot of, and I do get that question actually quite a bit is mm -hmm. what's you know is there a lot is it, there's a lot of similarities and to that I'd say other than being off the ground no mm -hmm. um, well we're really excited to talk um, with you about your work as an arborist climber um, and also hear how you've used risk assessing as a skill set both to um, in your day-to-day -day work but then also um, in your career path um, I would imagine, though, that, um, and you, you talked a little bit about this already, that um, you didn't um, think when you were really young that you were maybe going to be an arborist climber. So um, what did you imagine you were going to be when you grew up? So I definitely didn't think I was going to be an arborist because I, for the longest time, thought I was going to be a pilot. And that first, that 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 passion for aviation first ignited within me when I was actually going on my uh, first plane ride out to Las Vegas, which funnily enough seems to be a common trait between <laughs> this and my favorite climbing memory. So if you're really trying to find yourself, maybe go to Vegas. <laughs> <can't remember. laughs> That's totally different reasons. All roads though. go to Vegas. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I, I did not think I was ever going to be an arborist. So at some point uh, during my senior year uh, of um, high school, I actually changed what I wanted to do, and that was to forestry because um, I realized that aviation, although it's my my dream to be a pilot, um, the initial stages of your career are, are pretty rough, and I wanted something that was just a little bit more stable um, throughout the whole career. So I switched my degree over to forestry, and be so before I even went to college, I ended up changing my major, which <laughs> I think I, it's a very small set of people that have done that, but. <laughs> You know, I, I never would have guessed that I'd be climbing trees. I always thought for the longest time I would be flying. Well, they are both high up in the air, so you do have that common link between being a pilot and being an arborist climber. But I, I'd imagine that your background in forestry really helps you with your perspective of taking care of a tree and understanding how trees work. But can you talk a little bit about any sort of training and certification that are needed for being an arborist and how that's different than forestry? 
So some of the certifications that you can get to become an arborist um, is that you can become a certified arborist through the International Society of Arbor Culture. And there's a whole slew of requirements that you have to meet before you can go and sit and take the exam, which is just a 200-question multiple-choice exam. But you have to have the verifiable work experience, which you get through working on the job, um, working for either a reputable tree care company or at the Morton Arboretum or <laughs> any other number of places. So... You know, that, that's one of the main routes that a lot of people will take is just be, to become, at first, become a certified arborist. And from there, there are many other certifications that you can get through the International Society of Arbor, Arbor Culture um, that can help you specialize your career in arbor culture. So if you want to go work for um, a utility line clearance company, you can go get the utility specialist certification. Or if you want to go work for a municipality, a municipal specialist, or if you really want to go for the gusto, you can become a board certified master arborist, which is just a whole other list of requirements <laughs> you have to meet. So there's definitely a route for everybody and a certif and certification and training for everybody as well. Um, so it, it's a great career if you want to come out of high school right away and go right into working in arboriculture, or if you want to go to college um, and take the route I'm taking. Or you go to school, get a degree in forestry, which is a little bit different than arboriculture because forestry is dealing with uh, trees at the stand level and the forest level, so at a much more larger scale, whereas arboriculture, we're dealing with a single tree's health uh, rather than an entire forest altogether. So that's where the real big difference is. But a degree in forestry would definitely help you in this career because it gets you to understand uh, basic tree physiology, health, um, you know, how trees fit within the environment, uh, as well as uh, uh, several pertinent management management practices that you can incorporate into arboriculture to help you out a little bit, because some people will ask you questions about forestry as well. And there's also really great two-year programs as well that you can get in forestry. Absolutely. So there are trade schools that you can actually go to and get um, an associate's or some sort of certificate mm -hmm. uh, in an arbor arborist program. I know that there's actually one in southern Wisconsin that you can go to. Uh, where they'll essentially teach you how to climb trees, how to apply pesticides, um, how to do tree risk assessments. Oh, they'll, they'll teach you everything you need to know to become a successful arborist. And I know you mentioned um, working for like a, a reputable um, tree care company is kind of one path. And mm -hmm. maybe a lot of people who are getting certification or doing on-the-job training in um, arboriculture, like that's the path that they um, would take. Um, and so I would imagine that, um, you know, working in a non-for-profit at the Morton Arboretum um, is a little bit different than maybe how um, other people coming out of, um, out of the arboriculture field would, you know, maybe land more in a, in a, um, reputable private company than in a non-for-profit. So can you talk a little bit about what some of the advantages are of working um, at a non-for-profit like the Morton Arboretum and, and why you like being there? Yeah, so for the most part, the job itself is actually mostly the same as far as what we're doing. The same, we're doing the same practice. We're still climbing trees. We're pruning them. We're removing the trees. We are, um, you know, we're applying the pesticides. So for the most part, 90% of the job is the same. What's different is why you do it. And, and this is more of a personal thing for me, at least, and, and the reasons why I work at the Arboretum is because I wanted to do something that was a little bit more altruistic with my skill set. I didn't want to just be a kind of worker drone, um, you know, just solely there to make money uh, for a company, which there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I found just as much satisfaction working for a private tree company um, than I did the Arboretum. But there's one little thing that really drives it home for working at the Arboretum, and that's the impact that I get to have on our visitors, which is when they come here, they come here to experience and enjoy the trees. And I get to impact that in in sort of indirect way. Um, for example, um, I remember looking up the Instagram hash. Uh, there was a, on social media, actually, there was a uh, hashtag for the Arboretum, and I clicked on it. And I remember just seeing all these posts of people interacting with uh, this stump I had carved out with a chainsaw. And they were, you know, they were all over it, taking pictures and smiling and being happy. And it was, I remember it just being right before bedtime. So it really, uh, it's actually some of the best sleep I'd ever gotten because it just, it, it reaffirmed what I'm doing is what I want to be doing. Um, and really having an impact on these people's experience at the Arboretum. I love that story. Also, just because I remember when I was growing up that when we were deciding what trees to put in our yard, uh, my mom, you know, 
had come to the Arboretum because we lived in the area and, you know, got to see what some of the, the trees that she was thinking about, what they looked when they were full and healthy. And um, a lot of that is due to how well they're cared for and the work that goes into making sure that um, they're healthy and safe for people to enjoy. Um, so I'd imagine that um, it's, it's wonderful to hear that that's, you know, another benefit um, indirectly mm. of the work that you get to do on a daily basis. Our readings are just the best. I know that yeah. that's where I went for my senior skip day because it's uh, just really telling what those early experiences and where you end up in life. <laughs> now, you talked a little bit about the whining career path that you've taken. It's been a little bit um, non-traditional. Do you have any advice for somebody who's trying to find a career that aligns with their passions and skills, which might be a little bit off the beaten path? Yeah, so I would recommend anybody to really fully explore um, the possible careers that they can take. So if you go to college, for example, and, I, and I, I've seen this quite a bit when I was in college, is that people would get tunnel vision. Um, and what I mean by that is if they're like an accounting major, well, they think they just immediately have to go work for a bank or an investment firm or, or something of, of, you know, they think that's all that they can do. So they get this, they put these blinders on almost to themselves and they ignore what else is out there. For example, if you have an accounting degree, you could possibly go work for the FBI as a white collar crime detective. That's an opera, that's a possibility. Or um, with a forestry degree, for example, they really pushed us to go, hey, you know, go work for the U.S. Forest Service, go work for the National Park Service, go work for some other three letter, um, mm -hmm. you know, public land management agency. And if you really just, kind of pigeonhole yourself into that one little aspect, that one little possible career field, you're kind of doing yourself a disservice. So I'd tell you, tell kids to go, you know, look at the careers that are kind of tucked away in the corner, check those out, experience them, have an internship with them. Maybe you'll fall in love with it like I did, um, which that's how I got into, uh, into this, into this uh, career was I took an internship with a company that just said, hey, we're looking for people that are getting a forestry degree and are into rock climbing. And it ended up being one of the most enjoyable summers I've ever had and ended up leading to a, a career that I find immense joy in. That's really great advice. I. I also love that essentially, I mean, you're just reemphasizing the importance of taking risks and thinking, mm -hmm. um, you know, not being scared to try something that is not the logical next step or not what, um, you know, everybody else in the field is doing. Um, so I think that that's really great advice um, and also a great segue into what we ta want to talk with you next, which is about um, risk, risk assessing. assessing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I would imagine that as an arborist climber, it you know, you have to not only be assessing the tree for risk of, um, you know, its overall health and, and what can happen to it in the long term, um, but also about, you know, assessing for climbing and making sure that when you're going to take care of something in the tree that you're also safe. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you, you know, kind of start that process and how you assess risk as an arborist? Yeah, so risk assessing starts right at the at, as soon as I get to work. Um, you know, I'll have to be sure to inspect my gear, inspect the trucks. Um, so really, before I even get to the tree, I'm already have been assessing r at risk for an hour or um, however long it's been before I have to get to the job site. And when I roll up to the tree, I have to put my safety first before anything else, which starts with inspecting the tree <laughs> because if I'm going to be climbing up into it, it's going to be me that gets hurt if something goes wrong with that tree while I'm in it. So what I do is I have to walk up to the tree and I like to do this kind of thing where you look up, look down, look around. Um, and I got that from when I was take, getting a training from the Forest Service uh, for operating chainsaws on a fire line. And what it does is it helps you really break the the tree up into a bunch of different parts and it kind of allows you to focus on one that one single part for just a short amount of time. So when I look up, I'm looking up into the canopy, I'm looking for things like uh, broken or dislodged or hanging uh, branches that I can keep an eye for and that can possibly fall on me while I'm making my ascent or I'm looking for uh, weak branch unions that I definitely would not want to tie into um, and I'm also just looking for wildlife. That's a very common thing you'll find in trees are squirrels or bees, um, anything that could possibly um, 
be a hindrance to you while you're in the tree or possibly attack you while you're in the tree. So you want to be careful of that. Um, but then you're going to start looking down. You're going to go down the trunk of the tree and you're going to be looking for any obvious decay or bracket fungi on the on the trunk or uh, epicormic shoots. You're going to be looking for all sorts of little telltale signs that, hey, there's something wrong with this tree. And then you'll get to the the root flare and the immediate area in the, around, the, uh, around the root plate as well as extending all the way out. That extends all the way out to the drip line. And you're going to be looking for any sort of rot or, again, fungi, um, as well as any soil upheaval, which could possibly say that, hey, this tree is starting to um, list over and possibly will be windblown soon. So you kind of get an eye for it, essentially. And then eventually you want to look around, get the bigger picture of what the tree's around. You know, are there any utility wires? Are there any... Um, and it's over above the tree that you have to be worried about. Because sometimes there is, you know, mm-hmm. in, I mean, like I said, utility wires are a big one. Um, but also, you know, what's the what's around the tree? What are things that I could do damage to if I cut a branch or dislodge something? You know, maybe it'd be uh, a house or a shed, a fence, or even it could be cars or people that are walking by. So those are all things I have to take into account before I even enter the tree. I really appreciate the fact you're talking about how thorough you are with assessing the risk before you even step foot. Um, that's that's great to hear. Please stay safe while you're doing your work. Now, you know, once you're in the tree, I imagine that assessment continues, um, but there has to have been a moment where something caused you to have some fear or made you uh, really step back and check your assessments again. So do you have any stories like that to share with us today? Um. Yeah, actually, I had, I had a pretty recent one, actually, and it was when the crew that I'm on was, we were actually down in Naples, Florida, helping out with their botanic garden down there. Uh, we were doing some pruning for their trees, and I had done, you know, the normal risk assessment before getting in the tree. You know, I looked around, made sure there wasn't any, obviously, there wasn't any uh, utility wire, made sure there, the tree was sound and safe to climb. Um, well, apparently, I didn't do too good of a job. But I don't want to think that it's not my fault because when I was up in the tree, nobody told me that I'd have to be looking for lizards in the tree, which we don't really have many lizards. You don't, you don't look for lizards in Illinois? We no. Got no I, if you see one, let me know. Hornets, yeah. Lizards, no. <laughs> yeah. Um, and if you do see one, hopefully it's in a tree so then I can be, okay, then yeah, I guess that was my fault. But um, I was up in the tree and I'm working it and I'm looking around looking for where I'm going to go next. And all of a sudden, there's this lizard just chilling on the branch. And I'm thinking to myself, that is so cool. I've never seen that before. And so I go over. I start taking pictures of it because I was like, you know, I've, I've never seen a lizard in a tree before. <laughs> and, How big was it? Uh, it was probably about a foot and a half. So he was, he was, oh, that's a, not, that's big size. He's a pretty that's big, big lizard, yeah. <laughs> and what ended up happening is, you know, while I was taking a picture of it, it ran under the branch. And I kind of lost sight of it. And then I noticed its tail was scurrying under the branch towards me. And that was my cue that, okay, something's wrong. This is not what I expected. <laughs> I need to get out of this tree really quickly. So I ended up you know, getting out of the tree really quickly and almost running away from it because I had no idea. I, I mean, I've never had to deal with a lizard in a tree <laughs> that was running at me. And one of the employees ran over. He's like, oh, are you all right? You know, is everything okay? Like, what happened? And I started telling him, like, there was this lizard in the tree. I, I didn't know what to do. He started running at me. And so I showed him a picture. And he was, oh, that's, uh, I think he said a Cuban anole, I think is what it was called. And uh, he said, oh, yeah, those guys will rump your leg and bite you. So made the right call. but <laughs> Good assessment. Yeah, exactly. Good assessment. But didn't expect that at all. <laughs> and it was definitely one of those times where didn't really think about it too much. Yeah. Well, I'm, again, glad that you are staying safe up there. And next time, look for lizards. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we recently had teachers on site uh, to participate in a workshop, and we showed them your profile. We asked them what type of questions that they would like to ask of you. So um, we we're hoping that you might be able to answer a couple of those today. Uh, they really wanted to know what your first climbing memory was. Yeah, that's. Uh, we'd have to go way back um, before I even got into rock climbing, believe it or not, because I had actually climbed a tree before I actually touched any sort of rock. So it's kind of funny how my earliest memory mm-hmm. of climbing was actually in a tree, which now my most recent memory of climbing was today. <laughs> <laughs> and I was climbing a tree. So it's funny how that always works out. Um, but it was actually at a relative's, in a relative's backyard in a really small cherry tree. And um, I remember they 
I think they were babysitting me or something, and they just said, hey, why don't you go climb that tree? So me just being like, I was like, sure, that sounds cool. Adults giving me mm-hmm. permission to go climb a tree. Um, so I remember kind of getting near the top and just being able to kind of poke my head out a little bit and look around, and it was just really cool. It was, I think it was actually in the spring, so it was kind of flowering, which, or no. Maybe it wasn't a cherry then. I don't know. <laughs> it was some sort. I don't remember what I was in, to be honest just, with you. You just I remember d- climbing a tree. Yeah. And yeah. tree and cherry rhyme, so I must have just put it together. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, that was my first memory was uh, was being was actually climbing a tree, believe it or not. And now that I'm older and actually this is my career now, I am just scared that I even did. I can't believe it because <laughs> I've had branches fail on me just unexpectedly. So <laughs> oh, <laughs> good thing that didn't happen. Um. We also had a few questions um, that came through uh, when they noticed on your profile that um, in some of your previous work experience, um, you communicate with homeowners about trees and tree care. Um, What are some of the most common questions that you get um, in regards to tree care um, or um, the most common advice that you give to um, homeowners who, uh, you know, want to maintain healthy trees in their yard? Two of the most common questions that I get asked about tree care are, first, how to plant a tree, which is an excellent question because when it comes to planting a tree, that is one of the most important things that you have to get right, right away, because it'll it can impact the tree's health far down the line, far after you're gone probably. Um, so you can have a major impact on that tree's um, success and life by planting it properly. So that's a question that I'll always be happy to answer and I'm usually excited to answer because somebody's planting a new tree and I get to be part of that process. (laughs) The other one is a tough one and not for what you'd expect. So usually it's, it's some sort of question that has to do with a disease on their tree. But the way they describe it is usually either you know, with a really blurry picture that you can't even, yeah. you don't know if it's a bush, a tree, a house, who knows what it could be. Um, but then they ask you, like, oh, what's this going on with my tree? And you have to kind of, and if they don't have a picture, you almost have to, like, decipher it because you have to, have to start asking them questions like, okay, what kind of tree is it? You know, what are you noticing? Is it on the leaves? Is it on the, on the mm-hmm. bark? Is it, you know, on twigs? You know, what is it? And usually it'll come down to some something really common like black tar spot on silver maple um, or possibly, I mean, some of them more kind of out there like apple scab mm-hmm. uh, is another really common one. So usually it's a very common disease. You can as, figure out what it is right away um, when you figure out what species of tree it is. Because mm-hmm. as soon as they mention it, you'll be like, oh, are you noticing this sometime in late July? And they'll be like, yeah, that's exactly <laughs> it. And then you can tell them what it is and they'll be, oh, yeah, cool. Is it bad for my tree? Well... It's kind of like a puzzle. You just have to get all yeah. the clues to be able to figure it out, is. you know, yep. what it what it could be. It's going to say twenty questions. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Kevin, how has your perspective changed from being at such a great height, uh, suspended only by ropes, metal, and a tree on a regular basis? Yeah, that's uh, that's one I didn't really think I'd have to answer. I mean, that I let's do a little bit of introspection here. Um, I would say that it has made me take life a lot slower because, like I said, it's that constant assessing of risk, that constant stop what you're doing, look around, and make sure that conditions are unchanged and that, um, you know, you're, you're still safe. And I, and I really kind of hate using the word safe, too. I, I'm as safe as I, as I possibly can be because you're never truly 100% safe. Mm-hmm. Um, but you, you have to kind of stop and take a moment for yourself even in your own personal life, because sometimes things can get so hectic and um, so crazy that you almost start to just run on autopilot, and that's when you start to make mistakes. And it's the same thing in a tree. If you start to get frustrated for some reason, if things just aren't going the way they're going, you just have to close your eyes, take a deep breath, and just realign yourself. Get back to that, um, that, that kind of base level of... Uh, emotion and clarity. So to be able to incorporate that into other parts of my life, especially my personal life, and you know, even just in the work environment and, and, and being in an office or whatever, you you really do start to appreciate taking those moments and just kind of taking that mental break, that that slow down, and just reassessing the situation. And that's something that 
I've taken away from tree climbing and rock climbing and, and, and have applied it to my, real, my own life. I think that's such great, um, a great perspective to have, especially because, you know, when we initially um, set up to talk with you and, and I, you know, knew you loved rock climbing and you're a climber, I made all these uh, associations with like, oh, you must like be an adrenaline, adrenaline junkie, junkie and, you know, like <laughs> just want, like wants the rush of taking a risk. Mm-hmm. And the listening to you describe your experiences um, on rock with mm-hmm. kind of these real serene moments in the, in a natural setting and in the outdoors. And then also how, you know, the, that gives you the perspective to slow down um, and almost has like a calming effect um, mm-hmm. because it's so easy to get caught up in such a busy lifestyle that taking moments to calm down is such a great perspective to have. So um, I just I, I think that that's such mm-hmm. a great perspective to gain from being up so tall. <laughs> yeah. Um, we do have one last question to ask you. Um, it is one that we ask all of our guests. Um, and I know as somebody who climbs a lot of trees, um, this might be hard to pick. Um, but can you tell us what your favorite plant is? So it would be Circus canadensis, which is the eastern red bud. And although it's a tree, I don't usually get to climb because it's usually so small, <laughs> which is kind of funny how that works out. Maybe that's why I, yeah. I like it so much is because you don't of, associate it with work. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> or frustration. Or yeah. Because some, some, some like pin oaks are just nasty to get into. <laughs> so I don't have the best, you know, relationship with the pin oak. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it, it's just a very beautiful tree as beautiful flowers in the springtime and it has great fall and winter texture with the legume pod still on it. Um, but also, you know, the leaves are just these beautiful kind of heart-shaped sort of leaves that just, mm-hmm. to me, are just very uh, uh, pleasing to look at. And it just, just has a beautiful form and structure to it that I just, you don't see much on other trees. So it's definitely the first tree that when I get home, I'm planting. I, I second that. It is also my favorite tree and it was like a priority when um, we had a plant a tree that it was going to be a red bud, and I it I love it. It blooms every year, and I'm oh, it's just <laughs> like my favorite time when I pull up to the house and it's mm-hmm. all purple and gorgeous, and then it gets all heart shaped leaves. I just oh, I, I second your favorite tree. And yeah. Fun fact: you can eat those. Uh, you can eat the flowers. I did not really know. put them in salad. Yeah, so mm-hmm. little, they're so pretty. I know they are very <laughs> delicious too. So, <laughs> um, just thank you so much, Kevin, for being here today. You know, I second what Megan just said. You know, this this assessment of risk. It's just been really fascinating to hear from both your personal life with climbing to your professional life to the journey that you are taking with your career. And I think it's just fantastic advice for our listeners um, and anybody who is thinking about taking a STEM career. Stop. Take a moment. Assess the situation um, and then make the decisions that are the best for you at each point in time. So just thank you so much, Kevin. Oh, and thank you. This episode of Planted, Finding Your Roots in STEM Careers was made possible by the Morton Arboretum and the Multimedia Services at College of DuPage. Check out additional resources and bonus content at www.mortonarb.org backslash planted podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, like, and share, and let us know what you think. This is Jessica Turner-Scoff and Megan Wiesbrook, and we hope you'll continue to join us as we journey into STEM careers.